Hello everybody, welcome to my messy room. Today I am going to be reviewing episode 4 of season 1, Game of Thrones. And just a warning, in case you haven't read the books, I do tend to compare the show to the books. So if you're planning to read the books and haven't, and you're a spoiler freak, I suggest you at least have book one read. But if you're not too concerned about spoilers, my reviews actually don't really give away that much from the books. It's typically just some extra information from the books that might have been left out of the show or the book's version of what the show kind of did, which happens rarely. Or um, it's typically I only reveal it if it bothered me. But um, that's that. That's your warning. Um, so I'm going to get started now. We get started with Bran, who sees this three-eyed crow in his dreams. And typically, a third eye means some kind of sight into the future or some kind of sight across vast distances that isn't physically possible. And what this means for Bran, we don't know right now. And so hopefully we figure that out soon. Perhaps he'll get have more dreams that show us what it might mean. We don't know. All I know is this dream is not the kind from the books. So later on, Bran is brought down to Tyrion. And Tyrion's there to help Bran, but he's met with this complete disrespect on Rob's um, behalf. And I understand Rob feels like he's protecting his... Um, house and whatnot, but you do not want to get on the bad side of any house as wars within houses aren't um, uncommon. So I don't know why Rob's making this dumb decision. I guess I could blame it on his youth. But Tyrion, even though he's being disrespected, continues to do what he was meant to do, which is help Bran. And basically he helps him by giving this giving him this sketch of a saddle that will allow him to ride without use of his legs, which is very sweet, very nice. Um, but after he does this and Rob does offer him hospitality finally, Tyrion's just like, you know what, you don't mean it, let me go. And so before he leaves, though, he kind of stirs up some old history, and we find out Theon's story, which is basically Theon's father started his own rebellion to break away from Westeros, and... They obviously failed, and so Ned took on Theon as captive, so if his dad ever tries that again, it is Ned's duty to kill Theon. Yeah, that sounds pretty harsh, but that's what um, held captive means. Um, so, obviously the Starks don't treat Theon like this. They actually treat him like a part of the household, but ultimately that's what Ned Stark's job is, and that's why Theon's there. Which is kind of sad, but I guess it happens. Next, in the Jon Snow chapters, we meet Samwell Tarly. And Samwell is just this, just this coward. He hates fighting, he hates blood, he hates heights, he hates anything remotely scary. And in this society, that's not really acceptable. But Jon does have this kind of soft spot for him and does tend to protect him in some ways. But when he finds out Sam's story... Um, how Sam wasn't the, f the son that his father wanted and he was given this choice, the wall or make his, um, his father would make his death look like an accident. Um, he chose the wall and Jon Snow realized their stories aren't very different. Um, they feel kind of alienated from their fathers. They're both, um, grew up in this kind of highborn, um, I guess, environment, um, even though Jon Snow has no titles, he was treated like he was a lordling. And so they, he figures out they, like, they don't have many differences despite how different they are. So he does definitely double his effort to protect um, Samwell. And the only thing I don't like is that Samwell Tarly... Um, even though he is a coward, he has other talents, other things that he's good at. And these aren't mentioned at all in the show, which bother me because he could be useful. He has these talents, but they're never brought up. That really bothers me. And I don't know if it's because Samuel Tarly is the chubby one and that in our society is like down on. And just like in the most fantasies, um, we are 
fairly racist, like if you notice there are no people of color in this show. So, um, yeah, I'll, that's another rant. But um, whether it's because of that or if they just haven't gotten to it, I don't know. Another thing that bothers me about this is in one of the Jon Snow scenes, they justify why Sir Alistair Thorne is an asshole. And basically, Sir Alistair Thorne is just an asshole. And the re the what the justification they give him is that he was beyond the wall and he experienced all these terrible things and that's why he doesn't want any weaklings in the wall because they have to be strong in order to survive. First of all, there are other things you could do in the Night's Watch that don't involve fighting. Second of all, Sir Alistair Thorne in the books did not go through this. He is just the type of person who gets a position and abuses it and hates anybody who questions his authority. And obviously Jon Snow does question his authority as the arms trainer and that's why he doesn't like him. No justification needed. Sir Alistair Thorne is an asshole. Simple as that. And I hate how they justified him. But anyways, let's move on to Daenerys. Um, we find out Sir Jorah's story through one of the Daenerys scenes. And basically he had this expensive wife who just depleted his lord's resource, this lord's resources. And how you spend a lord's wealth, I have no idea. But Jorah must have loved her because instead of kicking her to the side or telling her no... Um, he ended up selling slaves to kind of appease her expensive appetite. And, I don't know, um, th that was illegal in Westeros. And so, since he is in Ned's jurisdiction, Ned put a bounty on his head, and so Sir Jorah fled. And so, that was his story, and you could see he misses home so, so much. Um... Whether he has this thing against Ned or not, I have no clue, but he does miss home, and it ten it seems that the reason is that Ned put the bounty on his head, but Sir Jorah did do the crime, so I'm not justifying him. Also, we find out a bit of Targaryen history, and the Targaryens ruled the dragons. They rode them, they had this special connection with them, and the Iron Throne was even forged by one. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Starks, um, kind of connection with the direwolves. Um, what this means, I have no clue why the Starks have this connection to direwolves and why the Targaryens have this connection to dragons. It just seems to be a magical aspect, um, which is awesome because there's no hardcore, like, wizards and whatnot. Um, right now, just little tiny magical aspects, um, right now, which I think is pretty awesome. Um... What else do we have? Oh, we have Daenerys completely standing up to her brother Viserys, and she just, like, beats him. Like, she, like, totally cuts him on the face and totally stands up to him, telling him, like, this, like, if he ever touches her again, that is it. And that was no empty threat, and I'm so proud of her. But there are just so many things leading up to her standing up to her brother. One of them is that she's pregnant, and obviously she has her baby to keep um, protected. And second, she um, is beginning to realize Viserys would not be able to have his own army. He is not capable of getting Westeros back for them. He is just this worm. He has no, as much as he wants to call himself a dragon, he is not. And um, I think that was the main thing that made Daenerys stand up to him. Um, she realizes she's the dragon. She's the one who um, is sitting there trying to bond with the Kalasar, trying to make the best out of her situation. And Viserys, he doesn't even try to connect with the Kalasar and learn their language, dress like them, and um, gain their trust. And it's just like, how are you going to lead an army like that? And so she's just realizing all of his flaws and... I think those are the main reasons that she stands up for herself and she just kind of like kicks him aside. Um, even though she still loves him and she's not going to actually harm him right now, um, she made it clear that if he ever crosses the line again, that is it. And so I am just, I'm completely amazed at the strength the Daenerys is showing because she was in that typical abusive situation, which it's hard for so many women to get out of. So, oops. Um, so what else do you have? Oh, in the Sansa, 
scenes, um, we see Sansa kind of just feels hopeless and alienated by everyone. Her dad killed her dire wolf. Her sister's mad at her. And now she's just stuck um, where she's going to marry this guy who doesn't love her or doesn't even like her or show any interest in her. And in fact, is just showing abusive tendencies. So she's just in this terrible predicament. In the book, she's more of a ditzy, clueless person who still thinks that he's going to love her and that everything's her fault. More of the typical abusive stuff in the books, um, typically because she has her head in the clouds and um, she still believes in Prince Charming. In the show, they don't do it as heavily. Um, she knows that he, he's not gonna get him. She's not gonna get him to love her, um, but she's still stuck in this situation and she's trying to make the best out of it. Um, Next scene with her is the tourney, and Littlefinger takes a particular interest in her and tells her the story of Sandor and Gregor. Basically, Gregor caught Sandor playing with his toys, so he does the extreme and pushes his little brother's head into flaming coals, and um, that was just terrible. The thing that bothers me about this is that in the books, it was Sandor who told Sansa this story, and it kind of starts this Sandor-Sansa relationship and side story that I absolutely adore. I think it's cute, but obviously Ma George R. R. Martin's version of cute is very different from the typical version of cute. So this is George R. R. Martin cute, um, this story of Sandor and Sansa. So I'm hoping they do do that. Um, since it was a side story, I can see how they could skip it, but I hope they do not because Sandor, Sansa, one of my favorite um, kind of side stories. Um, and then in the tourney, um, the guy who goes up against Sir Gregor gets a lance to his throat, which is completely gross. And that brings me to Ned, who Ned finds these three clues to John Arne's death because he's digging hardcore. He's not even being like discreet about it. But anyways, he finds this book of lineages and histories. He finds Robert Baratheon's bastard, and he finds the guy who got the lance through his throat. Um, those are all clues. We don't really know how they connect right now, but we do know that they are clue to they are clues to John Arryn's death. Um, Ned is uh, Peter also takes a particular interest in Ned, and it's just weird how kind of he pops up all over the place. He kind of knows so many things, and he's just kind of that person that you like but you distrust. And he's a very interesting character, and I really hope I really want to see how the show continues to portray him. Um, Peter is probably one of my favorite characters, and so we shall see what happens. Um, and then we also have this Cersei Ned spat, where it was just kind of another awkward moment, kind of like the Ned and Jamie scene where they like kind of just tossed it in there. This is like another one of those, but it does show you the tensions between the houses. And kind of just these little in-between-the-line sort of threats. And then lastly, I wanted to save the last scene, which is Kotlin Tully doing the stupidest thing of her career. Um, basically, it was cool watching Catelyn Stark calling all the bannermen of her house, um, you know, her father's house, which is House Tully. And that was awesome. She got them all together to arrest Tyrion. But this was the stupidest move that she's ever made. And this is the scene that makes me hate Catelyn Stark. Let's just think here for a moment how smart this choice of hers was. Let's look at Tyrion. Tyrion's sister is married to the king. Tyrion's brother is a knight of the king's guard. Tyrion's father owns one of the most powerful houses who already doesn't really like the Starks. King Robert is pretty much indebted to House Lannister as most of the wealth or most of the um, debt is owed to House Lannister. Catelyn Stark has no proof against Tyrion Lannister. Ned Stark told Catelyn Stark to not get her um, temper ahead of her. Peter Baelish is the one who told her that she didn't have any proof against Tyrion. So how in the hell is Catelyn Stark 
going to have Tyrion await the king's justice. Like, I quote, I'm quoting her. She said, Tyrion is going to await the king's justice. How? We already seen the king in the case of the dire wolves. He will not do anything against his wife unless he's given absolute proof, which Catelyn Stark doesn't have. What's smart about this idea that Catelyn Stark had in her head? Oh yes, nothing. So this is the scene that made me hate Catelyn Stark. And let me put away the fact that I love Jon Snow and I hate that she hated Jon Snow. Let me put away the fact that I love Tyrion and she just arrested my favorite character. And let's just think about the facts I just provided. What was smart about this action? Nothing. And this just sets this snowball effect of events that just continuously make me hate Caitlin Stark. This is the one event that you will see. You will see. I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I, if I continue, there will be spoilers galore. But this is a scene that made me hate Caitlin Stark. It's completely stupid. And um, so look forward to my future reviews of Game of Thrones. Thank you for your time. Bye.